Hi everyone, this is the Incept Connect podcast. I am John Osberg, growth strategist at Incept Digital Marketing here in downtown Buffalo. Today I have in studio with me a fellow 30 under 30 member, a uh, great community builder, great community leader, and someone that, uh, that I've learned from afar on. I know we've had some good exchanges over the last few years, and that's none other than Gary Sedal, Aquarium Niagara. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, excited to be here. What's going on, man? Uh, you know, it's been great connecting with you over the past couple of years, you know, 30 under 30 alumni. 2019. Yeah, it's hard to believe it's been that long pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. Feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, it really always great to be with people like yourself and uh, staying connected. You know? I appreciate that, man. I appreciate the, the energy you emit in Niagara Falls. I grew up there um, and have had a lot of different workings in the community like we've talked about, you know, off air uh, when we're not recording. And so it's pretty cool to see the things you're building and that you're a part of um, in the heart of Niagara Falls, New York. So. Kudos to you and the team and just even just the ethos of the Aquarium of Niagara and what you're doing there. I remember when I first went there last year um, for the first time in probably over a decade. We talked about this before we even started recording today. Just that wow factor of like, man, it's been over a decade. I'm a young adult now and being in here is super cool and the discover, rediscovery of so many different um, you know exhibits and animals and it just it, it was really cool to be there so a hearty kudos to start this conversation. I appreciate that. Yeah man so for those that are watching and listening um, would be great to start with an intro about yourself personal professional whatever you'd like to share. Yeah absolutely uh, as you said president and CEO up at the aquarium uh, we'll talk a little bit about that background and story that led me to that role I think in a little bit but I uh, live up in Amherst, Neary County with my husband, dog, and two cats mm-hmm. because apparently having 2,500 animals at work is not enough. So uh, <laughs> we add to the collection at home love a little bit as well. I uh, went to undergraduate school at Buffalo State College and grounded that out with a graduate degree at Medai. So right. Buffalo uh, Buffalo boy for sure. Buffalo born and <laughs> raised. Um, you bleed blue and red and blue and gold are Buffalo Sabres and Bills. Right. And um, yeah, and so Niagara Falls. Uh, let's let's jump right in because that's really the heart of it. So those that are watching and then for sure those that are listening, this is something that Gary and I have talked about now for maybe a year or two um, as I got to know Gary better um, and learning about your path to now, um, you know, where your career has been and really it's been one place and that's of course the Aquarium Niagara. So it'd be cool to kind of highlight that 19 plus year journey that you've now been on at the Aquarium of Niagara going from volunteer to now president and CEO for the last six years. So maybe we can hit that. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been an exciting story. And it's one that uh, I don't often tell, you know, sometimes you get stuck into the, the, the day-to-day movement, always focus on what's coming next. And, you know, it's sort of fun uh, looking back and thinking about the experiences and the people that, that bring you to the moments in life. So uh, absolutely, I call it my eyes wide open moment uh, happened with the aquarium when I was 10, you know, participating in uh, Cub Scout sleepover at the aquarium, was there with some family and friends and made a connection with the, the sea lions, mm-hmm. which are sort of a, a big, big charismatic species central to the great things happening at our facility and I fell in love with those animals and I uh, was fortunate enough to participate in a fundraiser that generated dollars that are so important uh, for the care of those animals and raised enough money that it caught the attention of some of the staff at the time and mm-hmm. they invited me to come meet some of the animals. Really cool experience mm-hmm. you can imagine as a 10 year old having the chance to go out uh, on the stage there on the platform and meet some of the animals is an incredibly inspiring experience. And it's those types of inspiring moments that I try and create now, not only for um, the youth coming up, but also our donors that creates engagement. So I I sort of got involved with the aquarium that way. I was fortunate enough to, at 12 years of age, be included with their volunteer program. In fact, one of my favorite stories on that is still in my personnel file, there's a note from my mom (laughs) allowing me to use a knife to cut up fish to feed the animals oh, man. Uh, because when you're 12 years old uh you know there's there's some logistics and legalities yeah. around that so it's uh, funny it's not a doctor's note or like a, like a <laughs> half day note but it's a note to, to yeah. use a knife i love it yeah it's sort of a cool story my mom yeah. loves that um so you know my parents were extremely supportive they provided the constant transportation to the aquarium that, that fueled my passion you know visiting volunteering spending summers there spending time off of school there, made some amazing connections with a really great group of staff, a, a group of staff that really provided me the mentorship and mm. opportunities to, to gain a lot of experience. So uh, a couple of years later, I was hired on for the first time. I, I worked in the gift shop at admission area, but also part-time with the animal care team. Oh, wow. So uh, you don't learn 
how to work with a sea lion by taking a, a specific course at a college. So a lot of that is hands-on learning. So I had the chance to do that, um, shadow the staff that were working, work hand-in-hand hand with more of the experienced team members. And that was really the launch point. So I spent some time moving up the department leadership there, had a chance to lead the marine mammal team, moved into a deputy director role and got to try my hand with a variety of other operations at the aquarium. You know, you think about animal care, but there's safety and security, there's facilities, there's the physical space itself, there's conservation strategy, there's master planning, all of these different things uh, for someone who, who came into the space as a, a marine mammal, you know, sort of uh, entry point. Right. Those were new skills to learn. And uh, very fortunately in 2016, I moved into my current role, uh, leading things and having the chance to provide mentorship and direction and collaboration with an incredible group of staff. Mm. They make it all happen. Mm. What an incredibly inspiring group to be around, watching the things that motivate them, watching the things that um, get them to think out of the box and deliver on our strategies. It is so rewarding. So rewarding, it sounds like it's amazing. And and so within that, you, you mentioned the words mentorship, leadership, collaboration, community, relationships. Um, be curious to hear on what you know you would as a starting point for us, like what, what do you think has, has served you really well in your journey from age 12 volunteer to then becoming in 2016 president and CEO? Like what, what would you pinpoint as like a knee jerk reaction, Gary, in terms of what you think has served you best in getting you from that volunteer role to the CEO? You know, we talk a lot about how you handle challenges and unanticipated events and unexpected occurrences, which I promise is all the time when <laughs> you have a building full of animals. animals yeah. and what I learned early on was that you're not going to get it right every single time. You're not going to be perfect every single time. And you need to create a little bit of space for inevitable failure. You know, you, there's a certain degree of risk tolerance that, you know, a business and an organization needs to think about. So you're not throwing all your eggs in a basket. But I really feel like I was always provided a space that if I made a mistake and owned that mistake or was counseled on that mistake, it was fine. Mm -hmm. We could move past it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that type of environment that allowed me to realize that you know you can step out of your comfort zone, you can step out of your box, you can try some things that maybe sound a little risky, but you can come out of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that type of environment is one that can't be understated enough. And, and that's hard for some people to get comfortable with, the idea of it not always being the perfect outcome. But I think it's more important than anything that you you try and take that stride and step out of that comfort zone. You have people around you that are gonna pick you back up and get you back on the trail. And I think one of the things I've worked hard to do is try and create that atmosphere for the people that I work with now. Mm -hmm. you know, letting them know that you can try things and we'll get you through it. And there's always the other side of this equation. And as long as we watch that, that risk tolerance, we can get everyone through it, okay? Wow, so almost like a, and this may not be the proper semantics, but like a, the first thing that comes to mind is like a failure buffer. Yeah, almost kind of like building that in like and, and there's a famous phrase out there. It's not win or lose. It's win or learn. And again, we were talking before we started recording about that action mindset, that action over everything, because without action, then, you know, sometimes it might be a regression or a mistake or whatever, a failure. But you can still learn in that next reapproach of whatever it is you're you know pursuing. So within that that loss or that you know not loss, I just said not win or lose, but that that that, that you know that that potential setback, you're going to learn, and then you can better be better off. So does that sound like similar to what you're kind of saying? Is that just building in that uh, the ability to have that? Okay, I I just uh, you know I, I went out for this campaign, it didn't do as well as we thought. Mm -hmm. What did we learn? What can we do that's better than the next one? Yeah, it's a hundred percent right. Okay. You know, without that, you you can stay on a very narrow trajectory, and I think what's allowed the aquarium to to take what could have been a very linear path and sort of add a little curve to it. And that's because we've been comfortable enough to step out of what maybe felt like the status quo. What are, yeah, I love that. If we can key on that, like, you know, what are some of the things that you that come to mind for you that are kind of the opposite of the status quo that you think have helped you go from that nonlinear or that linear to nonlinear kind of progression? Is there anything that comes to mind? You know, it's funny when when you think about the position that I hold in the job title, oftentimes there's not a great correlation between a 25 year old <laughs> and a president and CEO job title. And I, I think for me, that was the first break out of the status quo mm -hmm. because you didn't assume that to be the case. and. You know, for a while, I, when you'd walk into a room, they'd say, oh, is, is your dad the, the president of the aquarium? 
N- no. Uh, I'm getting triggered right now. Yeah. That, that, you know, that age thing, the gray in the beard, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but exactly. I'm being funny when I say that, but I continue. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. So, but that was the first breakout of the status quo. And, you know, candidly, for a number of years, I think the aquarium struggled with breaking out of a rhythm. And there was a lot of people trying to break that rhythm. But I do think that, you know, that immediate interjection of something new, something fresh, a completely different look and feel mm. of leadership, that that is an inciting incident that I think drives a lot of change. We call ourselves the, I sort of joke and call myself, my team, the, the Mavericks of the aquarium's history because it, it slants younger and they have a lot of different backgrounds. We have a predominantly female senior leadership team and breaking the molds and sort of bringing people together that don't necessarily fit that typical C-suite visualization, I think is what it's allowed us to not operate within a confined, confined box. Mm. I love it. I love that. And in a day and age where, you know, DEIB has never been so important, it's awesome to hear that there's a good mix of individuals. And the young piece, too, just I was joking about the trigger, but it's something <laughs> that, that I, that's followed me in my career, um, you know, with the, hey, you know, we need the CEO to be here or there's not enough gray in your beard. or um, So I've always I've adopted over the last like five years. It's from a, a mentor of mine um, who's since passed, unfortunately, but he basically would say, if you're good enough, you're old enough. Right. Right. So for you, if your skill is there passion, the vision, all that, the knowledge was there, then uh, then at the end of the day, a number is kind of arbitrary. And sure, there's some caveats to that. I get it. But I love knowing that that's kind of one of the first things that comes to mind for you and the team is that you've got, you look different than other aquariums, it sounds like, in terms yeah, of your staff. Of Absolutely. When you when you line up uh, other zoo and aquarium directors, you know, there's there's some differences, right? You know, it's a, it's for as an industry for a long time has been a historically male dominated field. The average age of a director is well into the 60s. And that's that's fine. You know, that's what got the industry to where it is today. But I think there's a lot of interest in all business, all industry and business to to think about how can we shift the position of leadership to drive change and to sort of remain flexible and adaptable to the things that are coming down the, mm. the pipeline. Mm. Beautiful. Segwaying a little bit on this topic, you know, I think the word community has been thrown around. Of course, that's that's our podcast. The whole focal point of what we do here is to discuss that when you build community, you can build commerce, differently set business, right? So, um, you know, the community is a big stakeholder and a big play, um, you know, a big factor, I should say, in the success of the aquarium. I almost look at, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I almost look at it as the aquarium is kind of being a community center, right? yeah. a place for people to connect to share experiences, to network, to go to events, to get educated, to have fun, to bring family. Um, I see it as being a community center. Is that something you would agree with uh, in terms of what you, you do at the aquarium? You're spot on. I mean, certainly one of my greatest visions for how the space can transform over the years is to make it that community hub. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just need to be a space that's limited to school field trips. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just need to be a place where you bring your kids when they're that right age. There's nothing that stops people from coming in as young adults for an evening date. There's nothing that stops friends from going in and spending some time and, and reconnecting. You know, we really tried to work hard in both the, the work we've accomplished recently, but also our plans going forward, a way to create a community hub and destination. And that can be done through a variety of ways. I, I You know, it's funny, when we talk about the community, I usually add the word host community. And I think mm. that that's important to us because the city of Niagara Falls is a very special place and it's a host community for us. We are there supporting the the lifestyle, the economy, the region as a whole, and that's really important. It doesn't mean that the Western New York community as a whole isn't relevant. They're incredibly relevant. Frankly, we see more Erie County visitors than we do Niagara County visitors, but that doesn't mean we should lose sight of what's happening in that very close-knit host community, the one that has been there for us for the 57, 58 years the aquarium's been around. Wow, that's beautiful, man. And and so um, for folks that are watching, listening that maybe haven't been, and this is something that I'll ask kind of later in a you know kind of wrap up mode, but for here right now in this, con- in this point of the conversation, for folks that haven't been ever or haven't been like myself and been there for probably 10, 15 years at least, um, you know, what's, what are some of the things that, you know, that they can look forward to? I mean, you mentioned donors. I remember seeing yep. that you had different, you know, you know, legacy, beautiful, just incredible inst- institutions with these beautiful exhibits that are tied to it um, and their, as their impact, their footprint in the community. But what are some things that individuals that haven't like been or, or, or it's been a while uh, watching, listening, what are some things they can look forward to and, and revisiting? It's one of my favorite things to talk about because it it is the dawn of a new era. I've heard it called a renaissance. I've I've heard the aquarium called the new little darling. Like I've I've heard all these sort of analogies for that. what we're going through, and that's incredibly humbling to be a part of. We've 
we've infused $15, $15 million worth of funding over the past five years to improve everything from animal enclosures and habitats to the visitor experience to just the physical site. And those investments are things you're going to notice. Right. Uh, historically, if you walked in, you'd see a 500 square foot penguin exhibit. Now they have 15,000 gallons of water and they're in a huge exhibit. So we've made improvements all the way around and it, it's a very common line to hear that oh, I haven't been there since and you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. Right. Since I was a kid, right. since I brought my kids there. I think that what we're trying to do is position ourselves as all of our outreach strategy, all of our external communications is if you have not been, regardless of the reason, give us another chance and come and see what we have to offer mm -hmm. because there's so many new things happening that we really see ourselves now shifting from a, a static living museum to a dynamic cultural experience mm -hmm. that tells the stories of rescued animals that creates inspiring moments for future scientists and draws awareness to the things happening here. Wow, I love how you just said that. It creates awareness, oh, I forget how you said it, but it was, like, it was like an inspiration for future scientists, right? Kind of like your moment right, where exactly. you had that spark, that catalyst, that moment where it was like, this is incredible. I'm you know, 10 years old, 12 years old, mm -hmm. and this is something I could see myself being involved in. And um, it's really unique. I've never, just total organic, candid moment, of course, that uh, I've not thought of it that way. That's really, that's really cool and important, especially cannily too with, not to get political or anything, but with how we're, the environment's going and sure. what's happening in, in um, you know, our ecology as a, as, a, as a world. I feel like the marine, the marine part of it is interesting. I'm not, I'm not don't know enough to comment on, but I think, um, I think there could be some, there's probably some really good educational opportunities at the aquarium. On that, um, I remember when I was there last, there was a really cool Great Lakes section um, for those that are, you know, aficionados of, of our Great Lakes, you know, obviously Erie and Ontario and then the other three. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing some really cool, you know, exhibits in the aquarium when I was there last. It was just super cool. So there's so many things you could do there, like you mentioned too, before we even start recording, or maybe you mentioned it tonight where it's that date night, you know, there's like a happy hour, there's events, there's networking. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of cool things that you can do there. Curious, you've talked about when we go back to that, I, I call it the failure buffer. Maybe it's differently said. Oh, I love that. that. That concept, right? You know, that's something that you've employed that has been serving you well. Are there things that you would outline to those that are watching, listening, you know, leaders, future leaders, um, pe maybe people that are interested in this space that you've seen that maybe didn't necessarily work for you, but that allowed you to learn and kind of pivot and do things differently? Is there anything that comes to mind with that kind of a question? Yeah, you, you can learn so much, right? We could probably talk for hours about the mm. things that I didn't do well and, and wish you could wind the clock mm. back on. But in some ways you wanna hold those experiences because they will inevitably stop that from happening again. But you know, you need these humbling experiences in your life. Sure. I think it's funny, you know, I, I think my leadership style um, maybe was harsher than necessary at an early stage, mm. you know, especially being younger. You feel like you need to compensate for the title, the position and the authority. and I think that for people who've been with me on this leadership journey, they've definitely seen my style pivot an awful lot, you know, and maybe it's called mellowing. I'm not sure what you call it, but there's no reason to go with things with a level of harshness that's inconsistent with the tone of the workplace, of the environment. I think that people get sort of wrapped up into the fact that they have these positions and titles and it can lead you to believe that you have to act and behave in a certain way. The reality is you can get pretty far in life by being genuine and authentic and humble about things. And I think from my perspective, I've taken the time to take that step back, to mm -hmm. think about the individual relationships that you're forming. You know, I call it individualized leadership. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly fine to talk to you differently than I might be talking to this person or that person. But do you know what style never works is harshness and aggression. That just causes people to seek avoidance. Mm -hmm. It causes people to um, limit themselves and the trust that they're willing to invest into that relationship. I just haven't seen it work. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen that work for a long time. So I think that from my perspective, thinking about the way that you treat people, seeding that in respect and being authentic to your true self, it's that whole look yourself in the mirror and you need to be willing to do that. And not just for a second, you've got to be able to maintain eye contact with yourself. It's important. And I think that's something that I've held on as a sort of true facet for you know, building the successful team that I have the pleasure of, of working with. Ah, well, kudos to you on that, Gary, too, because you outlining that to us also shows um, the audience uh, a really high end quality trait of a leader, which is to be authentic, candid, vulnerable at times. Um, and you sharing that is, is super inspiring for me to hear because I just, just what you said, I completely agree with me, people where they are. 
right? Um, you know, there's no one size fits all kind of thing. It just doesn't work, especially nowadays. And I, it's cool to see the shit that's happening in the workplace. Yes. I mentioned uh, two episodes ago, we released Glenn Jackson um, from m and Bank and they're cheap. You probably know those folks well. Yes. Do they, I don't know if they're involved as a, a partner, donor. Sure, yeah. yeah, partner. So so being their chief diversity officer, we just we just went to town and it was so inspiring. And some of the things that the nuances and the evolution that we're seeing in the workplace today is um, inspiring. Lots of work to do still, of course, but kudos to you for identifying that and then changing course so that you can become the best leader for those that are on your team as possible. And that's why you're doing so well. So a hearty kudos, man, a hearty Thank kudos. Um, I'm just trying to think through some other things. Yeah, free form kind of thing. We've covered so many interesting topics and things. Either is there anything that comes to mind that um, that that you'd like to share while we're on this platform right now, or do we want to kind of roll to uh, you know some of the current events that might be coming sure. in Q1 2023, Q2 2023? Is there anything else you want to add? You know, when when the sort of free form opportunity comes up, and you know you're given the chance to to choose something specific to highlight, you know, I think that has to be a, a thoughtful attempt and. You know, the thing that's coming to mind just from our conversation today is that you know we've worked we've worked hard the team has worked incredibly hard to modernize the aquariums experience to be true to our region to celebrate the stories of local wildlife to educate the public on, on, on education and matters of conservation and it really does feel like now's the right time to ask the community to come in and give the aquarium that second chance you know, you sort of have to shed that historic negative impression. If you remember the wood paneling, I promise it's gone. <laughs> there's, uh, there's I love no, that. No more yellow floors and brown ceiling tiles. Um, really I don't think it's coming back in style anytime soon. And, and I say that in a joking manner, but the reality is it is the dawn of a new day. The aquarium's taking its stride into the sun, and oh. we're, we're proud of that. And wow. I would ask anyone listening, watching, for the opportunity to come and give the aquarium another chance and to think of us as more than just a destination for field trips or a place to host your child's birthday party. Although those things are great too. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Like you said, you saw it as a 10 year old, but then I saw it as a 30 year old last year coming through and seeing the, you know, seeing seeing just the new, just how many new pieces. It's a, it was literally a completely, I, I can't even put, I'm falling over my <laughs> words right now, but it was uh, it was just such a different experience and i remember being in there like just smiling and like this is so cool and the way that the exhibits are set up and the history and how you could read and the interactive technology pieces to it it's Thank you, you know, of course yeah of course and anchored by the seal tank uh, seal right. tank right in the center there um so there's a lot there's a lot happening there and i know there's some other things that are coming that'll be more public in the coming weeks months that are Absolutely. very exciting also for the aquarium is more not to say it like this but it's it's more than just an aquarium, like like we said, it's, yes. it's a community center, and there's mm-hmm. some things that are happening um, that I'm excited to see come to fruition for you and the team. That'll just help again, help what you're doing, um, you know, sparking that insight, that it's inspiration, bringing people together, and then also building community and, and an economic, you know, kind of empowerment, development, focus thing as well uh, in the in the future. So, how do we? Uh, I guess we'll we'll finish with Gary. How do we? Um, how do we connect with you to start, and then how do we connect and find out more about the aquarium? Definitely. Well, the good news is as a public facing not-for-profit organization, you can find us. Google uh, will bring you right to our website. We have a really talented communications team that mm-hmm. are constantly producing messages and, mm-hmm. and content on social media. Uh, we, we like to do a little bit of a blend of uh, the education flair, but you know we've got to lean into everything we're seeing uh, on Sunday with the bills and have a lot of fun with that. And the, the team's really creative. So if for, if for no other reason than to, to tune in and Check see some uh, cute sea lion faces, there's, oper- there's reason to engage with us on social media. We've uh, recently, through lots of talks with you, been yeah. using LinkedIn more as a platform to I talk with our, our business partners. Uh, you have so many great insights on how to maximize the use of that platform. Thank you. So we, we're trying to post in and be very authentic and true to ourselves there. I think one of the things that you sort of coached me on was, you know, use a very genuine voice, you know, just talk about what you're doing, talk about what you're seeing. It doesn't always need to have that sort of, uh, you know, aristocratic tone yeah. to it to be effective. So those are great ways of visiting us at aquariumofniagara.org. And of course, coming in the front doors, piping that into the GPS and coming up for a visit. We're not that far. Everything's what, 20, 25 minutes away? Yeah, let's not even, I don't want to even get started on that because again, I grew up in Niagara Falls and I was a big uh, supporter of Trek, uh, you know, the the incubator and uh, community center around the corner from you guys. And just to hear, oh, it's too far. <laughs> it's some one of the easiest rides in town, you know, straight shot 190, two bridges, audio book, and you're, and you're there. 100%. Uh, I podcast, make that drive several times a day. Yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> and it's pretty too. I mean, yeah. if you take along the Niagara, 
you know the the parkway there it's uh, it's a beautiful ride and it's easy to get to so certainly worth the ride and time um we'll have all those those links in the show notes um but other than that man it's just been great it's been great to to see the evolution your journey and being there and uh, reconnecting and, and I appreciate the shout out with the LinkedIn stuff. It's uh, it's a great vehicle, uh, especially when it's used properly. And you guys are doing incredible work to, with with that, using that as a platform. So um, yeah, so connect with Gary. Check out the website. Get yourselves in there. Um, I need to get back in there. Uh, it's been been a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, I do run past it a lot in the state park. There, I've, I passed by. I think the one time you I did, texted yeah. you, uh, <laughs> and it was and it was it was awesome to see just how busy it gets. It was I think it was like a Friday or Saturday, and the parking lot was full, and there's people outside. It's still fall times, probably like a couple months ago. Yeah. It was super cool to see that. So uh, so keep doing it, man. Keep serving to keep soaring. And uh, this is another episode of the Incept Connect podcast. And I uh, just want to send again a big thanks to you, Gary, for joining. We'll see you on the next show.